The technique for breath meditation is not all that complicated. You take a couple of good long deep in and out breaths. Notice where the breath is easiest to observe and focus your attention there. And allow the quality of the breath to be comfortable. Try not to squeeze it, push it too much. Let it come in freely, go out freely. You can either let it find its own rhythm, or you can nudge it a little bit to see if longer breathing would feel better or shorter, faster, or slower, heavier, or lighter. When there is a sense of ease, think of your awareness spreading out and allowing the ease to spread out as well. Some people find that it's actually easier to observe the breath if you think of your awareness spreading first. So you're aware of the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out. Then you notice, well, what kind of breathing feels good in that context? This is a matter of personal preference. And you do that for a whole hour. The complicated part is the mind. You have to bring the right attitudes to this, because you'll find as you meditate that the mind has many minds, many attitudes, and a lot of attitudes that can get in the way. So you've got to bring as many skillful attitudes to this as you can, otherwise it's not going to work. It's not like a machine that you just wind up and it's going to do the work for you. You have to want it to work. It's a truth of the will, one of those things that's going to become true only if you want it to become true. And that's why when the Buddha talks about the factors that lead to success in the meditation, and he does talk about success, he's not one of those people who says, well, there's no such thing as a good meditation or bad meditation, it's all the same. That's not his attitude at all. There is good meditation, there's bad meditation. You want to succeed at doing this. And so the first factor for success is wanting it. They have to learn some skill in how you apply your wants, how you motivate yourself, and where you focus your desire. You focus your desire on the causes. If you focus simply on the kinds of results you want to get, read in the books about so-and-so becoming an arahant this way and becoming an arahant that way, and you think, well, you've aimed right there, and you don't want to have anything to do with anything between here and there. That's not going to work. You've got to go through all the steps. So you have to focus your desire on the steps. In the same way as when you're climbing a trail up the mountain, you have to focus on where you're stepping right now, otherwise you could fall off. So the chants we have before the meditation that's, are one of the means for giving rise to that sense of desire. You notice we had that contemplation of karma at least twice in the chants tonight. And it's good for bringing all kinds of qualities, or trying to stir up all kinds of good qualities in your desire. First it comes in those five reflections. It comes at the end, after you're thinking about aging, illness, and death, and the fact that you're going to be separated from all the things you love. Those four contemplations leave you hanging. It's the fifth contemplation that brings you home. In other words, if you're going to find happiness, it's going to have to be through your actions. Because the world out there doesn't offer much. It offers some things but then it takes them away. If you want happiness, you're going to have to provide it through your own actions. That gives rise to a sense of what's called basada, or confidence, that there is a way out and this is it. And how do you work with your actions? You train your mind. And that's what we're doing right here, right now. So that's one quality we're working on, is basada, or conviction. In the original sutta, the Buddha, though, goes on to point out that this is also a good contemplation for heedfulness, because you realize, okay, if you're going to be happy, 
It depends on your actions, but it can also come from your actions that you can make yourself really miserable. This gives rise to a sense of heedfulness, that you've got to be really careful about your actions, and that means you have to be very careful about the states of your mind. And the only way we can really observe them carefully and deal with them precisely is through the meditation. So that's another way of motivating yourself to practice. And at the end of the chant we had the chant on equanimity, which is also about the thinking about karma as it relates to all beings. That's to realize there are a lot of things out there that we cannot have an effect over. And if you get worked up about them, you're wasting your energy. So what does that leave? Well, it leaves your own actions that you can have an effect on, especially your actions right now. So again, that contemplation of equanimity is meant to bring you back here to the breath with a sense of desire that this is a good place to be. You want to be here. Elsewhere, the Buddha points out that this contemplation that all beings are the owners of their actions reinforces that sense of sangwega, that there's just so much suffering out there that we can't do anything about. And of course, there are actions from the past, our own actions from the past, that we can't do anything about as well. So these contemplations are meant to give rise to a sense of desire to motivate us to want to practice, to be willing to give ourselves to the practice. This is not one of those experiments where you set up the equipment and then sit back and just let the experiment do its own thing. You have to be willing to commit yourself. This is what the desire is for, is you're going to make it work. If you have that desire, then the, remain, the remaining, what they call, bases of success are a lot easier, particularly the persistence and the intentness. You stick with it. You give it your energy. That's the persistence part. And you try to develop a good momentum that carries on through this meditation and on through to the next meditation. John Fuhlman talks about how our lives tend to be divided up in times. There's a time to meditate, and then there's a time not to meditate. And the other time not to meditate is when you do your other work, or you chat, or you go eat, or whatever. But actually, you should regard everything as a time to observe the mind and try to keep the mind centered, regardless of what's happening. Because it's not the case that your defilements are going to come up only while you're sitting here and meditating. They come up all the time, and you want to be in a position where you can deal with them, at the very least fend them off. And again, realizing that the happiness and suffering experience in this life depends on our actions, you realize you're not making karma only here while you're meditating. It's all the time, 24-7, except when you're asleep. So you've got to be alert to what's going on in the mind so you don't let any unskillful intentions come in and take over. So this is the element of persistence. You give it the amount of energy that's needed to keep it going. And there's intentness, which means you really do focus your attention on what you're doing. You want to look carefully at the mind. You want to look carefully at the breath. Otherwise, you're not going to see anything. And you're sitting here watching your breath. The Buddha was watching his breath the night of his awakening. So what's the difference between his breath and yours? There's no difference in the breath. But there's a lot of difference in the powers of observation, his and yours. And the intentness is what improves your powers of observation. You really want to notice what, what's going on. Sensitive to how the breath feels. Sensitive to the mind to catch it before it goes running off. And supervising all of this is the quality of Vimangsa, which is 
be translated in a lot of different ways. Your powers of analysis, your powers of ingenuity, your, your powers of judgment. You read the results of what you're getting as you meditate, and then you use that in order to figure out what needs to be changed. This is probably the most difficult factor to develop at all, because it requires a lot of maturity. And in our culture, we tend to be really immature around our faculty of judgment. Some people don't like to be judged, or they quickly go from judging themselves to judging other people. Or when they judge themselves, again, they judge themselves as people rather than judging their actions. And it gets all tied up. This is one of the reasons why a lot of meditation teachers says, will tell you there's no such thing as a good or bad meditation, because they know that if you start judging things, you're going to screw it up. That's a temporary solution, but it's not the long-term solution. The long-term solution is learn how to become mature in your judgment so that you can become self-regulating. And you can look at your ideas and look at the attitudes you're bringing to the practice and see where they're lacking and see where they're going overboard. And you have to learn how to judge your actions and not come down on yourself for being really bad when you see that you're making poor judgments or you've done something unskillful. You've got to develop the attitude of a craftsperson. You're sitting at your bench, you're working on something. And you just realize that you plane the wood a little bit too deeply. So what do you do? Do you throw the wood away? That would be a waste. Do you start yelling at yourself? That doesn't accomplish anything. You figure out how to correct for the mistake, and then you move on. Perhaps it's because we have so few physical skills nowadays that we, don't, we haven't developed this faculty of judging a work in progress. Here's your opportunity to do it. Remember the basic principles. You're judging the actions, not you as a person. And the purpose of the judgment is so you can apply it to the next time around. If you're going to be noticing how other people are behaving around you, and you can't help it, learn how to do that in a skillful way as well. If they do something that's really obnoxious or really harmful. Ask yourself, am I doing the same sort of thing myself? Well, this is what it looks like when someone acts in that way or speaks in that way. Take a good long look at it and say, this is what I look like when I misbehave. If you see someone doing something well, okay, take it on. This is a habit that you can develop too. In other words, the purpose of the judgment is to bring it back to the next time you meditate the next time you breathe in and breathe out. And all the other unskillful narratives that we tend to build up around judgment, you just let them go like so much sawdust. Or in a John Lee's image of the person plowing through the field. Okay, the things you've done in the past, it's like the dirt falling off the plow. You don't gather it up and put it in a bag and carry it around. You learn your lesson and you leave it. If you can bring these qualities to the breath, you bring these qualities to the meditation, you find that this simple, very uncomplicated technique really can accomplish a lot in untangling what one of the famous verses the canon says, the human beings are a tangle, the world is a tangle, your mind is a tangle. And so what we do is we use something really simple like the breath here to untangle the tangle. So you've got the technique, now try to develop those qualities of mind around the technique, the desire, the persistence, the intentness, using your powers of judgment. If you bring all these qualities to it, this truth of the will will become true. The results that you want, the happiness you want. So you can get beyond this whole problem of aging, illness, and death, and all the uncertainties of karma.
someday you realize what the Buddha said about these things really is true, and that the escape is true as well. The freedom is true. But you have to be true in giving yourself to the practice if you're going to find this truth. <laughs>